First Minister, so this is a trip which has been very, very high on symbolism. What do you think you've managed to achieve in terms of hard politics? Well, of course, there's been a lot of symbolism. I addressed the Irish Senate today, first serving head of government to do so. So clearly there was a historic feel to that. But it's also been a very practically focused trip. You know, I started this morning speaking to 120 chief executives of major Irish and international companies. And the message there, and it was a message that was very well received, was about the importance of economic trade investment links between Scotland and Ireland and given a message that Scotland is open for business and we got lots of very positive feedback from companies interested in investing in and doing more business in Scotland. Similarly with the political discussions I've been having, we're not seeking to negotiate anything at this stage, that's not where we are nor would that be appropriate, but it's really important to Scotland right now that we try to establish allies and, and friends and people who are sympathetic to the objective of trying to protect Scotland's place, particularly in the, the single market. So yes, there's been, I guess, as is the case with these trips generally, some symbolism, but it's in the main been a very practically focused visit. And again, the backdrop very much Brexit. That was something that you conceded yesterday at SSE. You've repeatedly warned about the disaster for the Scottish economy in terms of a hard Brexit. Why is it, therefore, that in terms of trying to see off this disaster, the Scottish National Party only spent £90,000 to try and prevent this disaster? Well, I take the view that elections or referendums or any electoral contest, it's about winning. And, you know, we won in terms of the Remain vote in the uh, EU referendum. How much never... could you have spent? Well, you know, at the end of the day, what would it have mattered if we'd spent more if we won you based on what more we votes. did spend? Well, we... It might have said you would have had more trips on the ground. How much could you have spent as a matter of interest? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I can't remember that figure in terms of the spending. £700,000. Well, look, 62% of people in Scotland who voted voted to Remain. It was an emphatic, overwhelming, the biggest Remain vote anywhere in the UK. You think if you'd spent another £600,000 putting boots on the ground, you might have got more people for the Remain vote? Uh, well, Scotland, though, would still be in the position of being facing the prospect of being taken out of Europe against our will. Now, I, I don't think I will take criticism for a lot of things, but I will not, you know, be criticised uh, or, or willingly be criticised for not standing up loudly and clearly and very firmly for our position in the European Union. And, you know, I think I'm in, in a minority of being a leader in the UK who asked the people that I serve to okay. vote to remain, and overwhelmingly they did and that. And because of that, if it's a matter of constitutional law, that a legislative consent motion has to come before the Scottish Parliament in order to trigger Article 50, let's be clear, you will be voting against that. Yeah, because Scotland didn't vote to leave the European Union. Now, we've got some... So, as a matter of constitutional well, law, if, if the Scottish Parliament has a veto on the Brexit never... process... You will veto. I've, I, I've never used the term veto because I've always recognised it's not something I like, but I've always well, recognised... What term would you use? Uh, Scotland making its voice heard. Scotland having the ability to say through our parliament uh, that Scotland voted to remain in the EU and that's what we want. Now, I've always recognised and often had uh, UK politicians arguing the contrary that there are limitations to the legislative consent process. Now, we have to see how sure. the Supreme Court absolutely. decides on all of these issues. But you're absolutely but clear I... that Scotland making its voice heard is consistent with you saying, in terms of a legislative consent motion, we do not give our consent, and if that derails the entire Brexit it, process, it then, you'll be happy. It would then, look, I, I recognise there's a, a mandate in England and Wales to leave the European Union, but I'm the First Minister of Scotland, and if I wasn't prepared to stand up for how Scotland voted, and for what I judge to be in the best interest of Scotland, I don't think I'd be... Even if it derails the entire process? Well, you know, that's... I, if we wind the clock back to sure. the legislation, this is an important point, I, I understand that. The point I, I just want to be clear that system. if you can derail the process, I, you will. You obviously you, will. You, you, you have try to. to put words in my mouth here and, and make it sound very pejorative as if I'm trying to hold the rest of the UK to ransom. Now, in a sense, that's the nature of this, the, the political system we're in. I argued for Scotland to be independent, in which case we wouldn't have this situation. But I've got a duty and a responsibility to seek to stand up for Scotland. Absolutely. And that's what and I'm that's always what going to try you to have do. A, you have a duty to derail the process. These are your words, and no matter how many times you try to put them into my mouth, I'm not going to use you them. You have a duty to I, keep Scotland in the I, EU. I have a duty to try to respect how Scotland voted and try to protect the interests that I think are now under threat. Now, I will try to find all ways 
of doing that. Now, what I would say to the Prime Minister is, is this, work with us to try to find a way to square this circle. I have said that I want to explore and am exploring options that would allow Scotland's voice and vote to be respected uh, and also allow England and Wales to, to do what but, they voted for as well. But that has to be within the context well. of Scotland remaining in the EU. Well, I've said the, the priority, of course I want Scotland to stay in the EU, but I've said in recent weeks that the priority has to be to find a way, and this is what we're exploring just now, to see if we can find a way of keeping Scotland in the single so market. So the single market's the bottom line, not Scotland being a member Look, of the EU. I've been very clear about this. I, I want Scotland to stay in the EU, but I recognise where we are. So in an honest attempt to try to find if there is a middle ground and to square the circle so that Scotland's voice can be respected, England and Wales's voice can be respected. Is there a compromised position of keeping Scotland in the single market? That's, That's what I'm trying to explore. Let me ask you about something you said at Trinity College Dublin last night. It was uh, in response to a question. You said that the legislative consent motion is a convention and you then went on to say, and of course Westminster might choose to ignore that convention in which case we would be in uncharted constitutional waters. Do you seriously think that the Prime Minister would ignore the voice of the Scottish Parliament and effectively precipitate the first major constitutional crisis I, of the devolved era? I, I hope not. And what I'm, I'm trying to do here, and I, I don't control this whole process, and it goes back to your last question and my last answer, is to try to find a way of finding the middle ground that allows all of us to respect how the different parts of the UK voted. Now, I am willing, I, I'm somebody who believes passionately, as you know, I'm not giving you an exclusive here in Scottish independence, but as First Minister of Scotland with wider obligations than that, I've said I'm willing to try to find if there is that common compromise middle ground, that way of squaring the circle. But in order to succeed there, I need the Prime Minister to meet me halfway. So when we put forward proposals before the end of the year that will look at some of the practicalities around a differential option for Scotland, okay. albeit within the UK. I need the UK government to come halfway and explore that, that with ground, us. That halfway, as you define it, your words, not mine, <laughs> that halfway, as you define it, could be Scottish access to the single market, but out the EU. Membership of the single market, yes. So, you know, I've, I've said... But out I've the said, EU. I don't want to be out the EU. I know but you I've, don't, I've said, but that, that, I've said, could, that could be the middle ground. Though. If we're in the single market, not access to the single market, but membership of the single market. So, you know, membership in terms of the European economic area. Now, it's not my ideal position. I've, I've said on more than one occasion, I think, that that option is not the best option. The best option, in my view, is staying in the EU, but it's the least worst option. I actually hope the UK as a whole decides to take that least worst option. We're not in ideal territory here. Scotland didn't choose to be in the position we're in just now. And it may be that, yes, Scotland does have to consider independence again in order to stay in the EU. But as I said, I would do the morning after the referendum. I'm in good faith trying to explore all options. First Minister, thank you very much thank indeed you. for joining us in Scotland tonight. Thank you.